Sounds good. So welcome everybody who is here with us today for this morning's session about going global. We have a fantastic panel of speakers with us. Um, and I'm just going to move some things over here to my next screen. Um, so uh, welcome to the Going Global session. Happy to have all of you who are here with us today. For those of you who are in the attendees, you might see yourself uh, along with uh, the entire panel. Not to worry, you are not on camera with the other panelists uh, for the other attendees to see you. Um, it's just how the, the platform um, shows up on your end. All right, so um, today, if you are here for Going Global, then you are at the right place. So we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Seneca and Attawandaran and wider Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat First Nation. We recognize these peoples, the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwa, nations within the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and all of the peoples who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by continuing to strengthen our relationship with Indigenous communities. We formally recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all Indigenous peoples. With that said, we're going to jump straight into it with our agenda for today. I will provide a quick intro to MBEC, quick intro to our scale up series, which this session is part of. Then I will introduce our lovely speakers that you see on screen already. We're going to jump into our panel discussion. The speakers will introduce themselves, um, and then we have some questions for them. And then whatever questions that you have, please feel free to type into the chat and make sure that you use the all panelists um, function when you're submitting your questions. And that way I will read out your questions afterwards after we have the panel discussion to make sure that uh, your inquiries are all answered. So uh, quick intro into MBEC. MBEC is the Mississauga Business Entrepreneur Center, MBEC or MBEC for short. We are part of the City of Mississauga's Economic Development Office. If you are starting or growing your business, then we are your one-stop shop. So feel free to uh, come to us and ask us any questions that you might have about starting or growing your business. We are your central source for small business information, resources, and guidance. We offer things like free business information and guidance, webinars and workshops like this one today, other resources and tools, training and mentorship programs, entrepreneurship programs. If you have any uh, other curiosities about what we offer, go to our website to learn more about what we have uh, to support you in your journey to start and grow a business. Mississauga.ca slash MBEC is the place to go. You'll find more information about our business advisory services, our digital Main Street program, our Started Company Plus program, Summer Company program, and other additional training and workshops, including our additional scale up series sessions that we have coming up. And you can also find the recordings in addition to upcoming events and webinars and workshops. You can also find the past recordings of past webinars and webinars or sorry, webinars and workshops um, and review the material there if you want to use it as a reference. So the URL is here, the future is unlimited dossier slash small business slash training webinars slash uh, dash workshops for you to take a look at what's upcoming and also what has happened in the past. And if you have any specific questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us at MBEC. I'm John Lamb. I'm your host for today's session. I'm the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Specialist. Susan Loveless is our Small Business Consultant, and Laura Dunkley is our Digital Marketing Consultant. So please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any more specific questions that you would like to have answered. You can also reach out to our general email, give us a call, and of course, visit our website for more information. 
If you're on social media, please follow us at Mississauga EDO across Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Now, moving on to our scale up series. So, this session is uh, part is one of eight of the learning sessions that are part of our scale up series. And in 2022, it is capped off with mentorship, pitch practice, and a pitching opportunity that will be invite only um, if you fit into um, what the objective of this program is in terms of supporting scale up companies. So uh, it's designed to help innovative companies using industry 4.0 practices. If you're scaling a company with 100 K to 2 million in revenue, or if you have patents or you have patent pending status, or if you have raised a pre-seed or seed capital round, then this program is for you. With that said, doesn't mean that you can't join us for our learning sessions. It just means that the mentorship and the check-in and pitch prep and a pitching opportunity will be more suited um, for those who are scaling uh, with industry 4.0 practices in mind. You will receive these learning sessions. We are in our going global session already. You can check out our uh, the URL in the previous slides to see the recordings for the previous sessions. And please do join us for our upcoming sessions about scaling your product and investment deep dive. And as mentioned before, the ones in January and February will be invite only. So if you feel like uh, this scale up series is for you, if you fit into the industry 4.0 practices, um, and if you are scaling your company, then please feel free to reach out to have a conversation with me. I'm happy to invite you to the sessions in 2022. Um, so please reach out if you have any questions um, and if you're interested in the scale up program pilot that we have going on. All right, so without further ado, our panelists for today. So starting with Uche Onora, Uche is co-founder of Hitch, an educational platform linking applied learning to real opportunity for African students and teachers by providing access to world-class educational videos aligned with local curriculums. Uche is a seasoned technology entrepreneur, husband, father, and irrepressible optimist, and an aspiring poet. So we are super fortunate to have Uche joining our conversation today. Big round of applause for Uche. Thank you for being here. And next up, we have Radima Paravalli. Uh, Radima is an international trade and development professional with experience working in Asia and North America. Currently, she is the program manager of the Canadian India, or sorry, Canada India Acceleration Program, or CIAP CAPE for short, uh, which supports Canadian women entrepreneurs to scale and expand their businesses internationally. Big round of applause for Radima. Thank you for being here with us today. And last but not least, we have Rob. Sanders, make sure you say his last name right. It is Sanders and not Saunders. Rob is a senior account manager at Export Development Canada, or EDC for short, which is Canada's export credit agency offering innovative financing, insurance, and risk management solutions to help Canadian exporters expand their international business. So big round of applause for Rob. Thank you for being here. All right, so that's it from me. I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers for today to introduce themselves, introduce their organizations, and talk a little bit about why you think today's topic of going global is important for us to consider in the context of scaling our company. So first off, I'm going to hand it over to you, Uche. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, and, and great to be here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time out to uh, spend the session with us. Um, thanks to the rest of the panelists. Um, I'm Rob and Rizahima. Thank you so much. So um, just a bit of background and context. So um, I migrated. I came to Canada from Nigeria um, about seven years ago, um, solely because I have a son who is a special needs kid, and he was referred um, uh, to kids ability in waterloo so that's essentially how my story started coming to canada but in order to restart my life and career here after i realized and and, and moved my entire family my wife and kids here um, i ended up going back to the university of waterloo to do an embed degree 
Um, this was a mind shifting experience because this was when I got the tools to understand the incredible opportunity um, I've been serendipitously given to build a global company from the best com country in the world to do so. Um, so Canada is um, an incredible place to be based and, and there are a lot of things it has going for it. Um, in, in starting Hitch, one of the things that um, motivated my mission was um, the idea that access to resources could become an equalizer and to create opportunity for people and being able to do so from Canada, even though we're based with a Canadian company, um, but our market is in Africa because of the, the disparity of uh, educational equity. It, mean, it meant that from day one, we had to think about international. So it wasn't something where we had launched the business and we were here in Canada. It was from day one, we had to think about going international. And so um, it, for us, the core technology, the core resource we do is a machine learning curated library of educational videos um, and, and that can be aligned to various curriculums and texts and all of that. Uh, and, but the focus um, has been to use that Canadian expertise in an export capacity in a market that uh, typically wouldn't be on the radar um, um, for expansion. So typically, if a Canadian company are thinking of going to the South. So from that context, um, it, it basically put us right in the middle of um, trying to figure out how to do that, get that going. I had networks back uh, in Nigeria that I leveraged. But beyond that, even connecting to organizations that were Canadian, but that um, had um, export supports was very, very critical in that um, um, uh, bit to do so. So in terms of going global, I will say one thing. Canada is an incredible company to form a business in. If you're not already thinking about it, um, think about it. Going international is an incredible way to diversify your revenues. And there's a lot of support in Canada, even though there's some blind spot, but there's a lot of support in Canada to, to get that going. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uche. And I love what you said about, you know, it, it was from day one that you knew you had to go global, which is um, not very common when it comes to, to startups. So that's really cool. And, you know, in the entrepreneurial discourse, uh, if you will, you, you've started what's called a born global or an international new venture. It's from day one or very close to inception. Um, you're already looking at the global market. So definitely want to dive into that a little bit deeper. Uh, for now, I'll hand it over to Redima to uh, introduce yourself, your organization, and also uh, why you think this topic is important. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's lovely uh, to be in company of uh, other panelists, Uche and Rob. Uh, uh, I am Ritima. Uh, like Uche, I'm also a recent, well, I'm, I'm a more recent immigrant to Canada. I moved here just a couple of years ago, uh, but have uh, been in the international trade business for uh, a little while now. Uh, currently, I manage a, a program that supports Canadian women entrepreneurs who are looking to expand their business globally through the Canada India Acceleration Program. Uh, the program is a part of the women's entrepreneurship strategy uh, of the federal government and we are fortunate to have, uh, have a, a long-standing funding to deliver uh, these supports to uh, Canadian business women. Uh, through this program, we essentially offer uh, training supports uh, in international trade, uh, which could be uh, sales and marketing, trade finance, uh, fundraising. Uh, we talk about scaling your business as well, because global expansion means expanding your team. And associated with that comes leadership. Uh, how, do you, how do you move from being a founder to a CEO? Uh, we talk about uh, aspects such as that. Uh, additionally, we offer market research uh, and mentorship supports. And the final and the very key part of the program is uh, soft landing uh, support through our Indian partners. Uh, soft landing is a low risk uh, avenue for companies to try out a new market, to test a new market for, uh, for their product. Uh, through our partnerships uh, in CIAP, uh, companies can access market entry strategies specifically uh, catered to Indian market. And uh, they also get access to about three to four warm leads, depending on how attractive their technology is for the Indian market. Uh, coming to the point of why glo going global is important, uh, I think Uche raised a very uh, fine point here that uh, it, it cannot be an afterthought anymore. Uh, it cannot be. Uh, it cannot be that oh, I have a good Canadian product and now I want you know I have conquered the North American market and now I want to expand. Uh, a lot of companies that come to us understand that. Canadian market may be too small for their technology, or that there might not be enough uh, uh, enough market for them uh, for the kind of technology that they're building, uh, and that uh, opportunity exists outside of North America. 
and uh, it's it it of course it allows you to hedge hedge your risks and uh, stabilize uh, yourself against any mar market fluctuations uh, it also allows you to maintain cost competitiveness in in your domestic market as well through uh, through this global expansion i will stop at that and of course we can address uh, more issues uh, you know during 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 the session amazing thank you so much and uh... I love what you said about, you know, it just can't be an afterthought anymore. Um, that's so important. So we have two perspectives now from, you know, going global is important to think about and to pursue at an early stage. Rob, I know you deal with companies that are a bit more established, a bit further along. Why don't you give us an intro about yourself, your organization, and why you think this topic is important? Thank you, John. And thanks to the other panelists who, uh, who are here today. It's uh, quite a uh, quite an honor to be here with entrepreneurs. I'm not the entrepreneur. I am working for a very large uh, crown corporation. Um, I started my my career actually as a banker. I spent 20 plus years as a commercial banker helping Canadian companies grow. Uh, I did that with CIBC and TD, but have spent the last uh, 13, 14 years with EDC, Export Development Canada, who as John said, is Canada's export credit agency, and it's quite a different mindset from uh, what I was before in that I am really here to help uh, entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams um, and to feel, fulfill their plans and, and grow uh, internationally. So we, we try to help them go and grow and succeed internationally. Um, and we do that through a multitude of, of ways um, and by the way, I, I cover the Mississauga market, so I am Export Development Canada's uh, person on the ground. Um, I am in the Mississauga office opposite uh, City Hall on the other side of the parking lot from square one for those people who are in Mississauga. Um, and we I, and my market really is we cover GTA West, but my market is Mississauga. So uh, I am the go to person for for that that uh, part of the business. But, you know, we are a trading nation and uh, we need to trade internationally. As, as the other speaker said, you know, we are a relatively small population, we, you know, 36 million people sounds like a lot of people. But you go to the US, it's 10 times that you go to India or China and it's multitude times bigger than that. Um, and we need as an, a country to to export our product. The, the market in many, many cases is just not big enough. And there are many cases where a company has already saturated the Canadian market. They've grown up, they've done that, and now they're looking for new new opportunities. The other side of that coin though is companies can start right away and sell internationally. And that is very, very important as well. Um, we, we basically help companies anywhere on their export journey. It could be that you could be doing your first time export ever, um, or you could be a company that is selling uh, to multiples of countries and you're adding one more, or you just want to cover, you need some more information, you need some more risk mitigation. So EDC covers not only very small businesses, so don't be afraid if you're a small business and oh, EDC only deals with large corporations, that's not true at all. Um, we have a very strong uh, emphasis on small business um, and we have products that can be streamlined very, very quickly that if you're just insuring one receivable, you can go online and pay by credit card. Um, so we deal with both products and services. So if you're selling a service internationally, we can do that as well. Um, and really we come down into four things. We provide insurance for receivables. We provide financing for international business, whether that's here in Canada or we're financing something in a foreign jurisdiction. We also provide a significant amount of knowledge. We've been around for 75 years uh, as Export Development Canada, and we have a lot of knowledge. We have 22 offices around the world who have information. So if you're going to a certain country uh, and you wanna know some information about that country or how to sell to that country, contact us, we can try to help out as much as possible. But, and, and lastly, I just wanna circle back to the international piece. We've seen a little bit of a decline in the last few years in terms of international business activity by Canadian companies. And the Canadian government has recognized this, EDC has recognized this, and we have a very strong strategy to help grow international trade going forward. 
So hopefully that's a little bit of a starting point, John, and uh, maybe we can go from there. Amazing. Thank you uh, all so much. Thank you to the three of you for being here. Um, such wonderful introductions. I want to kick it off. Uh, I'm hoping we can get a healthy debate going on with, with this question um, just right off the bat. And, and I think Uche and Redima and even, you know, Rob, you, you talked to this a little bit. Is it too, is it ever too early to start thinking about international markets? All right. So I anticipate uh, that we're going to have a common answer here. Now, where I want to get into this debate is, well, when does it make the most sense to, to think about going internationally or take the steps to going to international markets? Rob, you've got the floor. Well, I think the key here is, and I and I thought maybe you might go to Ucha because uh, he'll say that that's where the demand was for his product. Um, you know, it sometimes is the case that uh, you need to go global instantly because your market is in a foreign country. But I think it's never too early to start thinking international. Um, and, and if you take the simplest form of that for Canada, the U.S. market is right there. Uh, it's right there. It's simple. The culture is similar. Uh, you can get into a car and you can drive to your clients. You're not traveling across an ocean. So it's never too early to start with international business, period. I think you need to mitigate some of the risks involved with doing that international business, but it's never too early to start. So I'll start off there. So I, I love that you brought up the U.S. Um, because oftentimes people might not think of that as exporting when in fact it is. So let's go to uh, Redima. I want to end off with, with Uche to you know talk about your personal experience. So I'm going to go to Redima first uh, about, you know, perhaps we're looking at markets overseas. You know, we're going to India. Um, what does that look like? When, when does it make sense for people to start thinking about going overseas to go a bit further um, to a country with a slightly more different culture than, you know, the, the Canada U S relationship. Um, so if, in my opinion, if, uh, the product or the technology that company is offering, uh, if that is not specifically built for a foreign market, if that's the case, then you, then you need uh, a validation from your home market for, uh, for your product before you move on, uh, you need to have a strong value proposition to be able to compete with other firms uh, in a uh, you know in a in an emerging market let's say because everybody is trying to go to emerging markets that's where the uh, that's where the business is uh, so you need a very strong value proposition uh, and the companies need to be able to price it accordingly so those are the first few considerations you need to start thinking about as soon as you're uh, you know talking about internationalization uh, in my opinion, also uh, America, uh, the states is a is a, is an easier market to expand to. Its proximity culturally, it's very similar. If we talk about uh, East Asian countries or South Asian countries like India, uh, there is a lot of cultural nuances that one needs to understand. So, do we have the capacity uh, to get into those uh, discussions? Uh, but primarily, I would look at how strong is my product. Uh, am I ready to take this and uh, show it to customers. Uh, do I have the validation from my home market? Amazing. And Uche, how 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 does you know what uh, Rob and Redima mentioned? How does that as you as you think about the process and and the journey that Hitch has been on? How how did those points resonate with what you've been through? Yeah. Thanks so much, John, and, and thanks, Redima and, 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 and Rob. Honestly, like once Rob, when Rob said what he said, I, I just thought back to something that I, I mean, I just kind of uh, came across in the past few months is that Canada ha has two major, you know, like the, the number of tenants that what it means to be Canadian, but two of, uh, of I think, some of the most important are one that Canada itself was built on international trade from the beginning. So it wasn't like um, Canada suddenly discovered international trade, and it's it's pretty ironic that at the time when Canada discovered international trade, it wasn't even yet Canada. Even when the provinces were there, it was about trade. Even though it's all about fur, right? Um, it was about international trade. The other interesting thing is that with the proximity to the U.S., and even though you know three quarters of of Canadian exports go to the U.S., and and you can easily get into that market. Another thing that's interesting is that. Canada's trade is not necessarily only dependent on, on the US. Like, I think 
part of the um, the beauty or the or the or the benefit of of Canadianism is that there's this multiculturalism built into what it means to be Canada. So that's the second tenet, right? This multicultural heritage that has evolved over time, even from the earliest times, it's called the land of immigrants. And then you have immigrants come from different parts of the world. And so what that does is it brings into the mix a different mix of founders and co-founders of, of businesses and entrepreneurs that can begin to think about international trade almost immediately. So from my own perspective, for instance, I have a Canadian co-founder. And so um, for, he, for, for, for us, it was, okay, there's this um, um, incredible opportunity. And like uh, um, Redeemer said, um, it, it was validated for our product. Right. And so once we were able to do that and validate that, what we started to do was to look for the supports that we needed to go international. Now, one of the things that Canada can do is with increasing numbers of, of foreign born and, and, and new funds moving into the market, you can continue to leverage that. And like Rob said, you know, the risk, the, the, the strategy to get into those markets as early as possible. But right to center it again, the, the US is there. It's you know, very seamless, it's very, uh, the opportunity is incredible, it's great, it's a huge market, but now what Canada can begin to do is like, uh, I would even say you can diversify what that looks like for you from a very early stage. So whether it's leveraging um, insights and organizations like uh, uh, Redeemers where you're looking, oh, I want to expand into India or I'm trying to, uh, other Southeastern Asian markets. And the incredible thing about it is even if you go to India, it doesn't mean you have to stop there. That can become, you know, your first stop on an ultimately South Asian, Southeast Asian strategy. For us, it was an African strategy, but what made sense was, well, Nigeria is, well, is the largest country in Africa, the largest uh, economy. So going into it was also almost like, this is our African for it, but from there, we can now even launch into additional markets. So it creates that almost like a spillover domino effect for you to keep on driving your expansion. And I think um, the, at the core of it is this premise that at the end of the day, at the, at, at the core of it, there's so much Canadian um, expertise and enterprise that goes into creating world-class products. So whether it's your Blackberries or, or, or your, your Bombardiers or any of this type of technology, or even any just regular products, right? At the end of the day, the markets are there, and I think it's navigating these different types of uh, strengths and resources that make it possible. For, for us at Hitch, it, it made a lot of sense. And tapping into organizations, I mean, we, we had talked to the EDC, we connected with, the, for example, the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service that was very helpful in helping us get into those markets. And so I think at the core of it, um, thinking about it from day one is important. Um, even if you don't do it, at least have a, 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 a like an actionable strategy that takes you into those markets as soon as you can be into those markets. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's that's amazing point that you brought up about hey, you know, the history of Canada uh, essentially was a was a born global company. <laughs> um, so that's that's really interesting. I mean, despite the you know um, issues with colonialism, you know, we can't deny that, hey, the, the fur trade played a huge part in establishing what we now know um, of, of the country today. So um, really great point there. Um, now, I want to get a bit deeper um, about things that people, you know, if they haven't gone international before, it might seem a bit daunting, even if they haven't, you know, been to the place that they're looking to go to. Maybe they've just heard from um, investors or advisors that, hey, you know, this would be a good fit somewhere else in the world, what are some lesser known or, uh, yeah, lesser known considerations, things that people might not think about, entrepreneurs might not think about um, when they're considering expanding outside of Canada? I hand this off to anybody who wants to start it off. I guess one of the things that I'll jump in on is that um, sometimes you forget the part of, of getting paid. Um, you know, you work so hard to to get a sale, to to get into a new market. You get excited. You get excited that you finally landed a new deal. You need to make sure your contract is is very specific as to you know when you get paid, how you get paid, um, and that type of thing. Because it's very easy when you're dealing in another part of the world for um, a company there to say, well, that company is so far away in Canada. That they're not going to chase me to get the money um, once I've got the goods. So that's that's one of the key the key things that entrepreneurs, in their excitement to sell internationally, sometimes overlook. And that's where that's where the uh, 
receivables insurance comes in from EDC, right? That's why um, you, you put that in place. Correct. So what we do is we insure 90% of what somebody owes you. So you're selling to a company in India or Nigeria or China or Mexico. Uh, we can insure those receivables that are due to you up to 90% of the value of the receivable. And if you don't get paid, uh, then we will step in and look and pay a claim uh, to that to, to that company who exported the product. Mm -hmm. So yes, <clears throat> and that's a that's a huge business. It's something that people don't think about. It's very very common in the European market when you're dealing in much smaller countries and you're selling between uh, European countries that you don't do business without doing insurance. It's a relatively new concept within uh, within Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. And Redima, is this something that you talk about with your program participants, or are there other lesser known considerations? It's, uh, it's very interesting what Rob said. I just wanted to build on that a bit. Uh, we recently were talking to a company that uh, exports lubricants, and they have been working with American clients for a very long time. Uh, they, have they have received some requests from Indian clients as well, but, uh, but the way the payments were set up was so different between these two countries that uh, that their American clients, they get paid only once the, uh, once the distributor sells the product. Mm -hmm. While in India, the distributor pays them upfront uh, as soon as they receive the product. So I, I think it's it's important for uh, businesses to understand that there might be differences in the way uh, these payments, uh, you know, these payments are structured as well, and you know, not get sometimes you, you can get cheated in in different cultures and different markets. Uh, but also another. Uh, I think very important consideration for small businesses, especially, is have you protected your IP? Uh, you know, uh, again, going to countries where the laws might not be as easily enforceable, it is uh, uh, it is really important. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself to very open. You know, uh, this is obviously more so with technology companies. Uh, you're really exposing yourself to uh, plagiarism there. Uh, we speak to a lot of SMEs who who find it difficult to pay for IP, especially if you're trying to look at different countries at the same time. You know, do I have to pay for trademarking in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and US and everywhere? Uh, we understand that it might be an added cost, but uh, it it is worth it to have a, a, a think about it before before really taking any action. And I just want to I just want to follow up on that. Have you seen Have you worked with companies who just said, "Yeah, you know, the the IP situation here in this country is just it, it's not something that we want to navigate at this point," and then just considered a different country or just didn't expand internationally as a result? Uh, we did have a case where a company had an international patent, uh, and they wanted to leverage that to enter Indian market. But they were strongly advised by the lawyers there that they should get a local uh, trademark as well. Local, uh, they should get local protection. Uh, the company was not in a position to pay for it because, again, they were looking at multiple uh, multiple routes of expansion, and and the the benefit of uh, they didn't see the benefit of uh, you know getting this protection specifically in India versus uh, the states. They were already looking at the states market. It's more stable. It's easier to, uh, you know, access. Uh, India is culturally different. So eventually, they decided that they wouldn't go there yet. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it, it is a key consideration for all businesses. And Uche, have you been swindled out of your IP or or out of your uh, your your receivables? Yeah, so, yeah, so that is, it's an interesting thing that I think uh, Rob brought up. And and again, this is where I go back to saying that even in the expansion even in the bold euphoria of of exporting and going and going global you still need to protect yourself you still need um the expertise the supports uh, and that's again why i said canada is incredible because you have organizations like edc the trade commission service soft landing program there are a bunch of different programs out there i think what's more important is even being aware that those programs exist and then taking advantage of them as part of your strategy so in planning it, it most times entrepreneurs are go 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 kind of people um you need to to um, have the nuts and bolts of how you actually do that expansion um built into pro products like stuff from this edc and the trade commission service from my own perspective 
I think part of the um, advantage we had from day one was we had um, incredible support from a local, uh, from a bunch of local ecosystem um, accelerators and support supporters who um, put us in touch and connected us with, to, for example, the Trade Commission service. Um, and so leveraging those to go in market, even though I was originally from Nigeria and I leveraged some of the networks I had there, we always came at it from the standpoint of being introed. And, and the Trade Commission service actually does do that. So in introducing you to those clients, um, what that helps do is almost like, well, it's like a kid going to school and maybe there's a bully and then you're not sure. And then the mom is saying, or the dad is introducing the kid. Like, so the trade commission service is there, um, making this introduction for you. And it gives you that, um, validation as a Canadian entity doing business. It, it, it helps to change the way the customer themselves perceive you. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing you need to do. It's one of other things that you need to do. Like Rob and Redeemer were saying, um, again, I think another, um, um, um thing. Um, that we were able to do was actually go into to partner. So, so another way to do it is instead of going into the market and thinking, um, well, you know what, I'm just going to launch a new product in this market where I don't know anyone and I don't have any infrastructure or boots on the ground, it might actually be better to partner. Uh, and so to do strategic partners with reliable, vetted partners on the ground who have a track record of understanding and operating in that market. Yes, it might mean you do a, uh, you share revenue, but it's fine. There's certain costs you don't carry and there's certain risks you don't have. And so for us, our biggest successes have come from those types of strategic partnerships and and what we did was to do an ecosystem scan to figure out who the stakeholders in those markets were uh, we use a lot of um, um, information uh, like rob said the edc has reports and things about the countries um, that you can access you you can also tap again the trade commission service and other types of things to get information research reports we had tons of market research reports um, there's a lot of support i think even from the canadian government for those types of market re re reports depending on where you're affiliated and i'm sure for example, with the MBEC, um, there are probably ways in which those re reports can be subsidized for companies who are, who are thinking about going abroad. Um, and, and then having that information and that insight can then guide your strategy. So for us, we, we partnered um, um, with, with, for example, UNICEF um, within Nigeria. Uh, we, we partnered with um, an organization called Teach for Nigeria, which is part of a global affiliate um, um, network of, uh, of teacher support organizations. Um, we also then uh, partnered, which is the, the, one of the most important ones um, that we've done is actually a partnership with the MasterCard Foundation, for example. So the MasterCard Foundation is a huge Canadian organization, but it has a lot of operations in Africa and a lot of focus on um, economic empowerment and, and education. Um, and then the last one we did was um, a textbook publisher. So the largest textbook publisher in Nigeria, we actually partnered with them um, to be able to sell our products into market. And so what that did is completely de-risked it. We can focus on product. We focus on supporting them to sell the product. They sell, we get revenue. Um, and so again, back to the receivables issue, like uh, uh, Redeem was saying, um, in the U.S., it was kind of like you sell and then you make revenue. Well, that's kind of what we're doing in Nigeria. So we, we so we 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 don't supply the product until they have a deal. Like if they have a project, oh, we need this, we need this order fulfilled. We supply the product, get the money, give us our revenue share. And so um, those types of things have have helped um, to mitigate some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, but I think ultimately, any organization thinking about it, like Rob is saying, you need to build and bake these things into it. it it's the nuts and bolts. The the headlines about expansion and going global is great. But when you get down to the actual doing of it, I think you need to build in those risk mitigation strategies to, to protect yourself. I remember you telling me, Uche, about how um, in Nigeria, the, the usage of email versus WhatsApp is completely different from what we have here, right? You contact people on WhatsApp and then if it becomes a bit more official, then it's like, then you email, it's a bit more guarded, right? So you, you, if I were to expand to Nigeria with, with a startup, I, there's no way I would have known that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So there are these, you know, cross-cultural, these customs, yeah. and unless you would have done business in a place that you're expanding to, it's hard to know. And even, you know, if, if you haven't been there for like five years, yes. things change so quickly. Right. So I, I want to go back to, you know, what you said about building the partnerships, uh, Redima, you mentioned the soft landing and Rob, uh, you have offices, 22 offices across the world. These are all, I'm, I'm assuming these are all, you know, efforts to help build those relationships to help, um, the entrepreneurs and the companies to understand the cultural norms of doing business there. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how, um, an entrepreneur of a scaling company might be able to accelerate the building of relationships um, and how to do so successfully 
uh, using the, the tools that you have or other tools that you might know of. Oh, yeah, mute, Rob. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I can start off on that a little bit. You know, we have, we have like I said, 20, 20 plus offices around the world, uh, and they're there for multiple purposes. One, they're there to keep uh, us apprised of what's going on in those markets. So, we have, for example, two offices in India, we have two offices in China, uh, we have an office in South Africa, uh, we have offices in the Middle East, we have offices in uh, Mexico. Um, they tend to be offices in places where Canadian companies generally go to expand. And so we want to have boots on the ground. They tend to be located in the Canadian embassies. Um, in those markets, a, a Canadian represents the office and then they have local staff. So it's a great combination of not only Canadian expertise, uh, you know, coming into the market, but also local expertise, which is probably even more valuable coming up from the ground. So those offices basically provide information back to, to us in terms of what's going on in those markets and what opportunities might be in those markets, but also they're a great resource for Canadian entrepreneurs to connect with these individuals. There's no cost of, you know, email or a call, uh, but there's long distance, uh, ind individuals in those markets. Uh, my, my, my good friend, uh, Jean-Bernard uh, Ruggieri, is in our Dubai office now, um, and you know I can email him today and say, hey, do you know anything about this or do you know anything about that? Um, and it's about connection. So sometimes they know local markets, they know local people, they know local companies, they know local reputations, um, those types of information. And if they don't know, they can ask around. So those resources are available for Canadian entrepreneurs to use and access, and I strongly encourage companies to use that. I had a company that was going to Brazil. They first time they were ever going into the Brazilian market uh, to consider selling their product. They met with the uh, with our chief representative in that market just to you know learn a bit more about what's going on. They know now they know somebody in the market. They they're not going into a country all by themselves and not knowing anybody. They're going there saying, okay, hey. Can you tell me a bit more about what's going on in this market for our product, for our uh, our industry? So those pieces of information are are significant. Having those those offices, again, no cost. So everyone, Rob is a great person to know. <laughs> EDC, get him on EDC. That's exactly right. <laughs> Happy to help out. And, and, and sorry, and before you read them, I don't care how big the company is. Again, I just want to emphasize that big or small, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Regina, sorry. It, it, it's great to hear uh, Rob talk about ADC support. We work very closely with uh, uh, EDC officers uh, in India. But uh, Uche said this uh, before, the Trade Commissioner Service is an excellent network for any entrepreneur to tap, tap into. In my previous life, I was a part of the Trade Commissioner Service. Uh, so I, uh, I was the intelligence on the ground. Uh, you could, I, I knew the market, I knew the India market well. So I would simply receive inquiries from, uh, I, I was working for the British uh, at that time. I would receive inquiries from British entrepreneurs about a specific company either in my network or within within the larger uh, subcontinent and we'd be able to provide them information for free. Uh, that was our job. So please do take advantage of it. They are a great resource. Additionally, you could also look at, uh, for example, in India's context, you could look at Indian High Commission based out of Canada. They are also here to expand bilateral trades. They also have experts uh, within their team uh, in in the trade uh, trade office to offer support or talk about what India offers, uh, you know, take you through some of the uh, talk you through some of the challenges that you might uh, face or or just address any challenges that you're facing already. That's an that's an excellent point because you know we as Canadians we might have EDC offices other in other places of the world, but other places of the world, other countries might have offices. In Canada, right? So working out those relationships can probably uh, help to accelerate too. So that's an excellent point. So um, Uche, over to you. Um, you know, building relationships, and I want to caveat this with, you know, it, it might have been easier for you to build the relationships being somebody who's from Nigeria, 
But if it was your co-founder, uh, who is not from Nigeria, what would it look like for him to have to build those relationships? Yeah, it definitely would have been in, in, in tough, very, very, very tough. But again, like I said, even for me, um, understanding the, the nuances of the market and the cultural stuff, but there was still that need to have the guidance, right? So, so back to the point about networks and contacts, um, that local knowledge, those, those, if you want to call it almost like intelligence, um, um, feedback from people on the ground, that network that Rob is uh, uh, talking about. Uh, I'd like to talk to Rob some more because I, I, I love access to that network. But essentially, the more people you talk to, the more people you connect with, the more likely you're going to get um, information that helps you make a better decision. Now, it's not to say that um, um, someone who's not from a particular market um, can't go into that market, but then it has to be even more deliberate in terms of the strategy around uh, getting those local contacts and those local uh, relationships established. Um, typically, again, which is why I default to using partners, right? Even in those markets where you don't know anyone, you don't really, you might not necessarily need to have boots on the ground if you find a reliable partner. And that's where organizations like EDC and even like uh, uh, Redeem was saying, like even if, for example, you're trying to get into Nigeria and then there's a Nigerian trade office here in Canada uh, and they can connect you to reliable partners on the ground. Again, it's it's the way you connect the dots. It's the the trail through which you get the the vetted contacts. That's the, that's the key here. You need um, organizations or people or contacts that can help you vet the opportunity because an opportunity comes up business person you might not know a lot about it it might seem daunting and you forget about it or it could be daunting yes but there's some guidance and there's some intelligence and some information that can help you access the right contacts that have been vetted so that's really what it's all about i think the vetted is there and even when you do do the vetting like rob is saying there's still some operational things you can do to de-risk the transaction right and part of why um, organizations like EDC are important is that even if you don't know about that if you approach them and saying oh this is a deal when you're in the process of negotiating a deal um, they can say oh no no you, you know why don't you request this because they have information about that market they, they know and so they can advise you and say this is kind of what you should do to make sure that you protect yourself so back to the point about um, um, uh, my co-founder like if, if this were the case I would say you know going through better channels to get to um, the partners or relationships is, is very very critical um, typically in a lot of markets, they, yes, there are some nuances culturally and otherwise that could trip up or even hinder or slow down uh, um, a, a deal. But but with that type of guidance, you're in a better position um, to succeed. And, and and even if you don't succeed, let's say you try it again. That's what entrepreneurship is, right? You try, if you fail, you try something else. Um, it's the, the risking of the trial. The, the risking of the failure is really very important for entrepreneurs to embrace. That's the thinking you have, the mindset you should have, like you are an entrepreneur. Well, you're a scientist, right? Uh, how do you control the experiment you want to run? You put certain safeguards in place and you do it. That's kind of the same type of approach that entrepreneurs and business people need to look at when they're, they're considering an expansion. And it could even be, for example, local associations here, right? So even here in Nigeria, there is a Nigerian association, different local um, areas. So in your local community, if you're trying to think about going into India, it could be the local um, Indian association or community there that you talk to or you approach um, in addition to all these other things. So there are a variety of um, organizations and things you can leverage or resources you can leverage. And I think that's part of what I think MBEC, MBEC uh, making this happen is, is important because you can aggregate all of this information and have that resource for, for entrepreneurs in, in Mississauga who are thinking about expanding. And so you can have a checklist. Okay, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have, and then you kind of guide them onto the path that they should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing points. And um, uh, add to that, John. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, uh, just yesterday, I was at an event where I met a trade delegation from India. These were a group of 40 companies within a specific sector that were brought by the Indian High Commission to Canada. They spent 10 days across the country. So it was a great opportunity for them to understand who is a legitimate partner, you know, where does the opportunity lie. Of course, they went to Toronto, Montreal. They came to Ottawa. They also went to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So these, uh, you know, there are some of these opportunities as well where we have uh, legitimate partners offering either trade delegations or some missions or conferences where, uh, you know, you could get some information about how to approach a new market. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we've covered, you know, these, these cultural aspects and I really appreciate what you said, Uche, about like that experimenter hat, 
because at the end of the day, it's it's business development, right? If, if you are an entrepreneur, you should have a little bit of experience in terms of um, working with customers and developing your business. So it's that process with the nuance of additional aspects of understanding cultural norms and, and the way that business is done. Um, so you kind of have to adapt what you do, but at the end of the day, the, the umbrella term is business development, building the relationships. Um, so I want to, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, the cultural aspects and understanding the cultural norms. I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you, Redima, because your, your program focuses on uh, women. So, you know, at that intersection, in addition to culture, how might gender play a role? What are some unique challenges that perhaps women entrepreneurs uh, face uh, that male entrepreneurs do not face um, and how can that be overcome? Yeah, this is something we talk about all the time throughout our program. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I can give you an example of how women are not perceived as decision makers. In, uh, in you know, at least in conventional industries like manufacturing, where there are fewer women to begin with. So if I take a woman entrepreneur who runs this lubrication company, uh, it becomes difficult for her to navigate that system. So we try to talk, uh, we try to coach our women entrepreneurs about how to how to address this. Uh, Uche raised a great point about you know WhatsApp. Uh, people talk talk over WhatsApp uh, in India quite a bit. They do business over WhatsApp in India, and it's it's uncomfortable for for a male to talk to a female on WhatsApp and you know, so, it, so there are all these layers of added over to just a, a, a vast cultural difference that already exists. Gender adds another layer to it. Uh, age is another factor. Uh, if you're not of similar age, if, you, if, if you're a young entrepreneur, uh, in India, you're not considered as, you're not taken as seriously. Uh, so I think, to, to succeed essentially is to acknowledge that and uh, and to reflect whether uh, you know you are willing to take that extra step to succeed in that market. Sometimes I, I understand that uh, for some it, it it you know it is just not possible to navigate uh, navigate this really wide divide and and we acknowledge that. Uh, for some, the market is big enough that they would they would still like to learn how to navigate the market. There are, of course, ways to do it, but it takes quite a bit of learning uh, and quite a bit of adaptation techniques to to be able to succeed. Uh, so we we and I do I do this I do a lot of coaching to uh, to our uh, for our uh, for our clients where I talk about all the experiences that I have faced. I have. Uh, I have been in a predominantly male, uh, you know, industry since since I started working, and uh, I talk through I talk about my experiences, the way I have tackled it. We bring in uh, women entrepreneurs from India to share about their experiences, uh, and and sort of you know build a community where you share uh, where you share experiences and tools to address this, and it works for some, it doesn't work for others, and we we, we acknowledge that. Yeah, thank you for that. Rob, what's your take on it? Well, well, um, I know that that's a, an issue, certainly, uh, and Redima's raised some very good points, especially in terms of, uh, you know, representation and age. I mean, even a, a, as males, that's often the, the situation. I'm sure it's exaggerated when it's, when it's females. EDC does have a, a team of individuals who are focusing specifically on women entrepreneurs and helping them with their international business activities. We do recognize that um, often uh, female entrepreneurs don't ask for financing as, as often. They don't uh, aren't as aggressive. They often finance it themselves and that type of thing. And we're trying to change some of that so that um, we're equally uh, opportunistic in terms of, uh, you know, helping an entrepreneur who's either a male or female. That doesn't really matter. So I have lots of female entrepreneurs on my portfolio that are doing international business that are running both very small companies and very large companies. So I, I see I see the successes, which is fantastic, but I think there's significantly less. Yeah, have you experienced, you know, have you worked with a client that has kind of gone through the situation that uh, Redima 
described, you know, about say if they're expanding to India, um, the men might not want to speak to the women on WhatsApp. It might be an uncomfortable situation. How do you navigate that? Is that something that, you know, the offices across the world kind of help with um, and, and in what ways? I think that is where some of our, our folks can help out and, and with their suggestions in terms of, of, of dealing with it and, and, and maybe talking to the chief rep in that market. As an example, not in India, but in Australia, our chief rep is a lady. Um, you know, so maybe that helps too, um, having a, a, fem a female chief rep dealing with the female people in, uh, or the people in the in country. Um, same with Mexico, interestingly enough. I, I talked to my chief reps in uh, in Mexico just the other week and uh, both of them are, are, are females, um, do a fantastic job in the market. So I think that's part of it is connecting with EDC and, and seeing if we can have, have be of assistance. That's my only thought. Gotcha, gotcha. Uche, you know, you've seen the difference between the Nigerian market, Canadian market, how entrepreneurship is conducted, how um, technology companies uh, might flourish and succeed or not. How, how does gender play a role in, say, the Nigerian market versus the Canadian market in, in what you've seen? I mean, it, man, it, it is an incredible um, um, challenge um, um, that women uh, entrepreneurs face. I can definitely um, say that um, even not that from my direct experience, but even from um, um, my some of my colleagues, um, I, I know how um, in the Nigerian market it is tough. Um, women um, face a lot of significant barriers. The difference when you contrast it with Canada isn't that women don't face barriers in Canada is that it's that Canada has been purposeful about addressing the issues that women face. It might not have, it's might, it's not, it hasn't gone away, but I mean, a central theme of this is just thinking about this from a standpoint of Canada, I think if I'm not mistaken, is the first or maybe even the only company that has as a core of its foreign policy agenda and international feminist agenda, right? And so um, front and center, Canada is saying, this is who we are and this is how we operate. But then in, in a market like Nigeria, where there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of um, um, gender bias, definitely towards men. I know, for instance, the conversations and the opportunities for business that I would have versus uh, a female entrepreneur would have would be completely different, even in terms of like what Redeemer said, you know, interacting, whether it's on WhatsApp, whether it's even just being able to get meetings, even being able to be taken and considered um, 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 as the final decision maker in a lot of instances, that also affects their ability to do business. So, for instance, at, at, at Hedge, I, I do work, um, um, one of my um, um, colleagues is female, and so when she has meetings and, and, and has discussions with, with potential clients in Nigeria, I definitely see a change in the perception if I'm in the room, right, like if I'm there. Mm. What I try to do is, uh, as my own, if you want to put it, um, um, contribution to that is to be active and purposeful about um, the fact that if, if if someone's trying to circumvent my colleague and come to me instead of having to, I'm like, no, uh, she, she's the one who has it. So you redirect, right? And so doing those types of things early and actively, I think um, from a company standpoint can help. But I think for the um, female entrepreneurs themselves, like Rob was saying and, and Redeem was saying, it's finding the, the, the in-country allies or people that can advocate on your behalf and that can help um, the business situation go. And I think by putting a lot of um, um, pushing some levers and doing certain things and being purposeful about those things, it can be made clear um, to that. It doesn't mean that the challenge goes away. Um, in a country like uh, uh, um, Nigeria, it's very patriarchal. It's, 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 it's a patriarchal system that doesn't necessarily favor women. Um, and I think that um, um, a lot of, uh, and I have a colleague, I have a friend who actually is a female entrepreneur who, who I know has faced some of these challenges, like just trying to get a meeting, right? Okay, I'm prospecting, whether it's off of an introduction on LinkedIn or something, um, um, it, it, you know, sometimes you could just get ghosted, you know, like the person doesn't even come back and say, oh, this is what it is, or that's what it is. Um, and so um, it, it just takes a lot of resilience, I think, on the part of um, female entrepreneurs. It doesn't have to be only that way. And that's why I think the supports that organizations like EDC and some of the trade commission services and, and, and what um, Redeemer's organization does is very critical because you do need um, that support. You, first of all, you do need the sensitivity, if you want to call it training, so preparation to prepare you mentally to say, this is what you might face. This is kind of how this market is, right? And, and if you have that sensitivity built in or you've, you've kind of gotten that coaching to say, this is kind of how it is, and these are some of the ways you can mitigate and navigate, maybe that can become um, the way to get in. But I think 
yeah, the, the peculiar challenges that uh, female entrepreneurs face, and it's unfortunate. But I'm, I'm happy that, for example, a country like Canada has been very purposeful and upfront about it. I also think that um, there's some organizations um, also in the local markets that, that, that you can connect to that can also help, for instance. And so whether it's from um, um, associations, I know that, for example, in Nigeria, they, they have associations like women in business um, types of associations and groups. You can also use those and maybe part of what the Canadian support system can do, like ADC and all that, is to connect with those types of advocates in country. So, for instance, um, there's, there's a women uh, in, in business uh, group in Nigeria. I know there's women in technology, there's women. So, there are different types of women um, advocacy groups within the in country um, uh, markets that you're going into. And so, the connections between the external support system for Canadian female entrepreneurs and the in country people could also become an additional layer of support that helps them kind of navigate that. Because even even now, like there's some women in country who have maybe gotten to a certain level of success who uh, want to open the doors and want to keep helping and advocating for women. And if you connect to people like that, it can also ease certain discussions and conversations um, that that culture might um, have have obstructed in the past. Yeah, so it seems like there are resources that are available. Um, of course, there's a lot more work to be done, you know, not just in Canada, also, you know, around the world. And um, I think the, the best that we can do right now is to navigate those challenges and, you know, call them out uh, while we work on creating a more equitable society for us and, and model that, you know, on the international stage. Um, before we jump to the um, next question, uh, Redima, do you have anything to add, you know, based on, you know, what you've done in, in your program, you know, based on Uche's points, um, and Rob's points. Do you have any stories to share about uh, any of the the clients that you worked with? Any examples? Uh, I think what uh, Uche has said about uh, finding local allies is a, a and Rob uh, is a very good point. Uh, that's why through the program, when we offer introductions, we our partners and I we are on the call uh, and and we try to bridge that cultural divide. Uh, you know some. A yes doesn't mean a yes, uh, you know, simple things like that. <laughs> uh, that that sometimes get lost. Uh, uh, while while almost everybody knows that now about uh, some cultures, it's it's still surprising to me how many times you can misread that. Uh, so uh, you know, we try to bridge those divides uh, by being present uh, during the meetings. You know, just supporting them uh, with uh, sort of. It's essentially we are we are telling the Indian clients or customers that these entrepreneurs are coming with a level of seriousness uh, that you know that we are putting we as a government program are putting our might behind these entrepreneurs so please take them seriously you know it's not just a random entrepreneur that has contacted you even then you're sure technically it's business but at least now the entrepreneur is going with a little bit of weight behind them saying hey we are part of a federal program you know uh, and uh, uh, you know, and then we have this great technology. So come talk to us. We we do end up getting quite a bit of uh, quite few serious players from the Indian market because uh, you know because they think that uh, the entrepreneurs are coming through a specific program and are supported by uh, supported by the government. Uh, and and we use we we leverage that uh, we we leverage it as much as possible. We provide entrepreneurs support to. Uh, it, uh, you know, I coach them, like I said, about, uh, before the call about, you know, how to navigate, like, who is the most senior person? How do you understand who the most senior person is in a virtual call? <laughs> you know, you have to address the most senior person first and then so, uh, talk, uh, talk to others in the call. And so I coach them ahead of uh, ahead of a meeting about all of that. Uh, we, uh, I, we also talk to the Indian uh, clients about how it, how business is done differently in different parts of the world. We try to. Through this program, we also try to sort of, uh, I would say, not educate, but bring awareness to uh, in the Indian market about how other uh, other countries uh, other countries work. Really, uh, while we are moving to a more globalized society, everybody watches Netflix, so everybody thinks everybody understands each other's cultures. Uh, there is still quite a bit of difference in how we conduct our businesses and. I think it is important for all of us to come to a sort of respectful place uh, to be able to conduct successful international business. Mm -hmm. Very well said. 
Yeah, so um, I, I love the point that you made there about like addressing the senior person first, because, you know, we get a little bit of that hierarchy here in Canada, but in other places in the world, the power dynamics, the, the hierarchy, like it is very, very structured, right? And somebody might not have that kind of um, understanding. So it uh, sounds like, you know, based on what Uche was saying about, um, you know, going somewhere and, and vetting other business, it sounds like, you know, EDC and uh, CIAP are, you know, great to kind of help Canadian ventures be vetted as they go, you know, to other places and to help them to understand the cultural norms. So that's amazing. Um, I, we have 25 minutes left. Um, for any of the attendees, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat. Make sure uh, you are sending it to all panelists, um, and then I will read them out. Uh, for the time being, I want to get to know like the the top three to five steps. The first three to five steps in your mind. So, and an entrepreneur is saying, "Hey, I recognize that you know I need to go international." What are the immediate three to five steps that that they should take? Um, Rob, let's start with you. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> no problem. So, I, I mean, I mean, I guess we look at what exporting as a journey, right? So, you know, the the, the first thing you're going to do is that you're going to be doing business across a border. Uh, make sure the contract is is properly structured. Make sure that you've probably insured it. Make sure that uh, those things are set up. Once you know, once the first step is done in terms of the the journey, you've thrown the product across the border, so to speak. You send it by truck and it's gone there. Um, and it may be that then the next step is to put inventory in that market. Um, so you actually have inventory in the market such that. You don't have to worry about it getting across the border in a timely manner so that you start putting inventory in the market. So that's sort of one other, another, the next step in the journey. Uh, and the next step in the journey is to actually invest in that market where maybe you're doing some manufacturing. So that's kind of the export journey overall. When you're first starting off, <clears throat> I think the key to it is make sure that you know who you're dealing with, make sure the contract is sufficient, make sure you've insured it, um, and, and, you know, and don't put all your eggs in one basket. Let me get this. Um, so, no dealing with. Make sure yep. you're insured. Can you repeat the the other steps? I think I think well. I think the key. I think the key here is to have a good plan. That's really that really is. I mean, the first step really is to have a good plan. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, the various boards of trade have a trade accelerator program, one of which is run out of the Mississauga Board of Trade. Um, which helps a company write a business plan. So I think that one of the key things is to have, first of all, a good plan of where you're going and why. Um, and then once you've done that, you've, you now you've made some contact within that market. So now you've got contacts. And now you make your sale. And once you've made your sale and your contract is structured properly, now you probably should be insuring it to make sure you get paid because as I just said, <clears throat> excuse me, you've done a lot of work to get to this point. <clears throat> And the last thing you want is to not get paid. Sorry, hang on. <laughs> so I think that's I think I think that's the early stages of it, and then as you grow, <clears throat> as you grow, the um, then then that's when you start putting product in the market, and then you maybe start manufacturing it there. Gotcha. Have a good plan of where you're going and why you're going there. Know who you're dealing with, make your contacts, make your sales, ensure your sales, put the inventory in the market, invest in manufacturing. So that seems to be the the uh, trajectory. That's the journey. Uh, Uche, let's hear from you. You know, from from day one, knowing that you were gonna go global from day one, what steps did you take? What were the the most important three to five steps uh, in in order that you would take now if you had to redo things? Yeah, no, a lot of it would be um, uh, kind of what um, Rob has said, but I think for, for us, the main thing or the first thing that we had to do uh, was to first validate um, the, the, the demand, right? And so um, demand validation can come from a number of ways, but, but primarily you want to do a lot of discovery. You, if you can, you, you want to find out if really what you think is the opportunity is really the opportunity. And you want to hear that 
um, from people on the ground. A lot of times, some you know products or businesses, it, it's it's very straightforward. Like it depends on what it is you're doing. But if you're creating something new, something different, or you're a new entity trying to get into an existing market with something um, 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 different or differentiated, um, you want to first of all say for all this to be worth it before I even start putting in the effort to you know like um, ensure my prod um, um, receivables and do all those other things is the product that I'm selling into this market needed, right? What is the problem I'm trying to solve at the core of it? So coming back, taking a step back from the product and, and the solution of the service you're selling and going back to the problem. So is this a problem in this market, right? And so once you can validate that it is a problem and that there is an opportunity for you to then make that expansion, then everything else can build off of that. Like you can then put in the time and the effort and the resources it then requires to then sell what it is that you want to sell. But once you can at least at a minimum validate it. And so that's the core of what we we, we focused on and had to do. Um, we, we initially went after a different um, target audience or a different customer. And then we had to dial it back and switch our, our, our customers. If I had to do it over again, I would focus more time upfront on that discovery process, which would have helped us identify and prioritize which one to go after. Because again, something that happens is depending on what it is you're selling. I mean, a lot of times you might have overlapping niches of markets in the market. So understanding who your target audience in that local market is or which one is the best target audience to start with. So it's a sequencing thing, right? So you could have two, three segments you can sell to. The question then becomes, which segment should I start with, right? And so figuring out what segment to start with um, is, is all part of discovery, which has the biggest pain or the biggest need, which you know has the biggest budget, wh which one, um, has the most compelling, is this a nice to have, is this a need to have, is this a must have, like right now, um, is also um, very helpful to helping you gauge the opportunity as well. So everything uh, Rob said stacked on top of that, but you know, if you can also, before you even begin this, figure out a way to validate it, it's interesting. And, and there, there are also ways in which you, you can explore the market to try to do the validation. Um, I, I, again, th that local insight is very um, relevant and very helpful. Um, I think um, uh, one other thing I will say is that a lot of Canadian companies now can leverage and draw on, again, going back to the multiculturalism of what makes Canada Canada um, very early on. So I remember, I think it was, um, I want to say it was Wattpad. I remember a couple of years ago, I was listening in on, on the CEO talking about when they wanted to expand into a new market. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it, it was Vietnam. What was interesting was he said, initially they were trying to get, because they, they, they have content partners in the local markets who write for them. And it was, they were thinking about, oh, you know, we need to set up an office in Vietnam and we need to do other. And then someone's like, no, no, let's take a step back. There's a Vietnamese community here in Toronto. Toronto is one of the most diverse and multicultural um, 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 cities in the world. How about we get some, start building our community from there. Let's start from there, validate, figure out. And, and that's essentially what they did. And, and that then led into this massive expansion and became a massive opportunity for them in that market. So they, they came back here to Canada and they were able to tap into the network here to, to do some kind of, if you want to call it discovery um, um, efforts before they then built all the other things on, on top of it to expand. So it's interesting how Canada has these um, assets that, that are latent that might not be very apparent to people, and, but that are there and that can be very helpful. Thank you. Gotcha. So uh, there's this element of validating demand, um, customer discovery. It's back to the basics of, you know, starting uh, something, something innovative, right? You're, you're, you have to focus on, on the customer. And I think that goes back to a point that you made, Redima, earlier about, you know, when it makes sense to, to think international, well, kind of have to start with validating the product, validating the business, because regardless of where you're selling, whether it's in Canada or anywhere else in the world, there's no demand. If there are no customers, you don't have a business, right? It doesn't matter, right? You can put your product in the market. It's, nothing's going to happen. So, Rajima, what are the top three to five steps that you would suggest for somebody considering going international? I think more, uh, there is very little new for me to say here after Robert Luce, but the one uh, probably key uh, aspect I would like to add on to that is uh, the ability to adapt, uh, be agile. Uh, like Uche said, you you think you are you are going after the right customer, but sometimes you're not, and then you have to dial back and quickly adapt to finding a new customer or whatever learning you've had from the market, and the adaptation doesn't 
uh, it doesn't work if it is just from the leaders. The leaders are always excited to go to a new market, and that's that's how the journey begins. I think there is a need for the organization as a whole to adapt to this culture uh, because you know it's it's the team that is eventually delivering this expansion plan. Uh, is your team ready? Is your team culturally enabled? Is your team? Uh, uh, do you have the do you have the team culture for them to be able to ask the right questions and you know like have a safe space where they can ask questions and uh, not not face repercussions? I think those are some of the uh, sort of softer aspects of expansion, but uh, really still really important. Mm -hmm. So, so important. I mean, you know, we can talk about this from the, from the founder perspective. Yes. And they can be ready, but if it comes down to implementation and they're not, your team isn't culturally enabled, then things are going to fall apart. Right? So yeah, that's, that's a brilliant point. Um, okay. So I want to reach out. Uh, I want to, I want to read out a uh, question that we have from the attendees. Um, how long does it take to plan going global until the final we are open for business. What what's the timeline on that process? Anyone feel free to jump in. So timeline on going global. So I, I think it depends on what it is, right? Uh, everything kind of boils down to uh, it's, it's going to be different uh, for everyone. Um, again, like I said, from day one, we we were thinking about going global, um, but I think. Um, it, if you have already, you know, some insights about the market, if you have, let's say, one of the founders who's already familiar, it definitely is a shorter time span. Um, I, I, I would say it could be anywhere from, you know, um, you've done the research, you've done all this stuff. It could be anywhere from three months, a couple of months to, okay, you know what? Um, it might take a longer time and a longer strategy to get this done. Again, um, going global also doesn't, it depends on whether you're defining it as you have product in market already. Um, typically, if it's a technology product that's delivered over the internet, there's a lot less logistics associated with that. At that point, you're selling access to servers or access to stuff. If it's something where you're actually shipping products, then there's a whole different um, 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 mindset around, okay, by the time I get it shipped, you know, um, is it from here, I'm shipping to Canada, who are my shippers? Like, it just depends on what it is that you're doing, right? Um, but I think it can be pretty quickly, depending on the market. It depends if it's the U.S., like what we say, like it's right here, it's right next door. Canada has a trade agreement with the U.S. Um, again, if it's a U.S. Um, service, you know, like uh, software or something that your so solution you're delivering over the internet, that can be like, boom, right? So it all depends on what your business model is, um, how is it paid for, like uh, Redeem was saying, Rob was saying, get paid for it. If it's something where you're selling access, people have to pay up front to get buy a subscription, you could set it up and be selling in a few weeks, right? And, and so everything just depends on what type, what is the product, what is the market, what is the um, a model that you have? Is it is a subscription model where people are paying up front or is it pay on delivery? Um, is it, oh, we sell to the, send it to the distributor, they sell and then they give us the money. Those are the different types of things that come into, into play in terms of how quickly um, you can go global, I, I think, from that standpoint. Again, um, the EDC, I'm sure, has additional um, timelines on how quickly they can process stuff. So if you're making a request, that if you need the EDC to, let's say, ensure your product or to ensure your receivables, um, again, all of that would you have to bake that into it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And Radim, what, what has been you know your experience working with uh, companies and founders going to India? So we usually work uh, with technology companies mostly. Uh, we we have very few clients who are uh, in the manufacturing or the physical goods space. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to talk to the physical exporting part, but Technology wise, I think it's just a matter of how long the sales cycle is for that uh, sector. Uh, if you're selling an ERP solution, the sales cycle is six months to a year. Uh, you know, that's just a typical sales cycle. If you're uh, maybe trying to sell uh, a, a marketing product, uh, something that makes your marketing more effective, uh, it's just a matter of finding a right, maybe, you know, marketing agency, just one or two clients and pilot your pilot your uh, technology. Uh, it, it, uh, Uche is right. It really depends on what you're trying to sell here. Uh, I, instead of looking at how long it takes for us to do actual business, I think I think the the more key uh, 
aspect is to plan for it really, to understand where your market is, uh, how are you going to get there? Do you have the financial resources? Do you have the capacity within your team and for yourself to be able to do that? I think that would probably take longer uh, than doing business itself. And I think the, the question is addressing that planning stage specifically. So how long have you seen that planning stage take? Uh, I have, I think I, I've seen, uh, it, it, it really depends. I've seen some, uh, some really, you know, young startups who, whose product like Uche's has been ready for Indian market directly. It, it barely has a market in Canada. So they know that that's where they need to go. It's just a matter of them getting there. Uh, for some, it could take about six to eight months, in my opinion, at least that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it depends. I think I broke up there a little bit, but I think it also depends on the technology. If, if you're supplying into the automotive trade, um, you're going to take a long time to get into there. Or say your pharmaceuticals, or life sciences, you're going to need to have some approvals to get in there. So, to to Redima's point, you could. I think the key is to plan, and that's that's the part that takes a lot of time. And it could be three months, it could be six months, it could be a year. You got to get that plan down. Pat, to know who you're going to talk to, how you're going to talk to them, what's the process to get into that uh, before you can actually go into that market. And then um, it, it, it's, so, it's so unique to every situation, it's very hard to answer that generically. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, programs like EDC and um, yep. CIAP are here to help, right, to kind of navigate those nuances of sector and the market that you're looking to enter and, you know, all the different variables that are available uh, to consider. But that's also what MBAC does, right? You're helping with, with business plans and that type of thing, right? And, and I, I can say just again on the, on the TAP program, which is a trade accelerator program, it's run primarily, uh, it's a government kind of program. It was started by the, the Toronto Board of Trade, but it's expanded across Canada now. Um, and the purpose of that is to get entrepreneurs together to actually build that business plan, but expose them to the issues that they're going to face, the financing, the regulatory, the, um, um, the various logistic issues of, of dealing internationally and building that business plan so that they're ready to go. And they're doing it virtually now. Um, so it's a, it's a great program for anybody that's interested. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, that's the TAP program, the TAP. Trade Accelerator program for anyone yeah. who's curious. Yeah, Ms. Awesome. So, Trade will have something on that too. Just sorry, John. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. Thank you for for pointing that out. Um, next question that we have from attendees: uh, How can we find out if there is a need for the product or service in that particular country that they're trying to sell to? How do you go about validating the demand? Um, I think. Uh... Let's say you have a product. Uh, I, I need. I think I need to take an example to, to talk to talk this through. Uh, let's say you have an edtech product where uh, you're selling supplementary material for school children. Uh, let's just go with that. I think you would. You you obviously look at uh, the Canadian market, American market. Uh, you know, look at the school boards and uh, what what supplementary material means. Uh, if you're looking at markets outside of this, uh, either Latin America, Asia, African market, the school system is completely different. And uh, um, you you basically start with desktop research about you know what kind of curriculum they offer, uh, uh, you know what kind of uh, what kind of additional services do people usually use. I think a good way to understand that is look at who your competitors might be. And what's what solutions they are offering that gives you an insight of what kind of specific demand there is uh, for. For sort of your customer segment, uh, trying to find who is offering similar services. Uh, it may not be exactly the same again. Uh, that's why you have a strong value proposition to expand. Uh, but essentially looking at who your competitors might be in different countries, uh, a little bit of desktop research should uh, pop that up. There are a lot of business schools that have students uh, who are interested to do these kinds of services. We offer through our own program Carlton's uh, business students who will do this uh, for our clients. Uh, I think there are resources out there for you to be able to do some basic uh, research first and get more specialized services if need be. Uh, 
uh, again, reach out to trade commissioners, uh, see if uh, this is something that they can provide uh, advice with. Mm -hmm. It's the the customer discovery process, right? As it, regardless of where you're trying to sell to, um, it's about understanding the lay of the land, understanding the competitors, what's adequate about them, what's inadequate about them, and what makes you special, and then start building the relationships, right? All right, Rick, um, John, to that point, I mean, is what, what is your, what is your competitive advantage? I mean, that's the key to it, right? Is why if I'm going to start, start selling it from Canada to a particular country, why are they going to buy it from me? What, what, what's special about me and coming from Canada that there's something going to say, Hey, I'm going to buy that from Rob Sanders. That's the key. And I think that's what Redeem is saying is that you got to figure that part out as to, is there a demand for this product in that country? And can I be competitive? It might be that you're selling mattresses and they're the best darn mattresses in the world, but you can't ship them to, to Nigeria because the transportation costs will kill you. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So you got to figure that out is, you know, can I land it there? Is it, is it a better price? Is it a better quality? Is it a better, uh, you know, solution? What is it that's making them going to want to buy it from me? That's, I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So we have a few minutes left and I think, uh, I want to ask you Rob specifically about this. Um, I often hear early stage entrepreneurs say their competitive advantage is we are Canadian, you know, as they, as they consider mm -hmm. the international markets, how much weight does the Canadian brand have w when it comes to trying to sell internationally? I think there's a lot of weight there, depending on what you're selling. Um, if you're, for example, in the food business, um, then the, the the quality of product coming from Canada is well understood. I actually had a few years ago, uh, an entrepreneur was selling water to China to make tea. Um, and you would think, okay, that's that's insane. They were shipping bottled water because it had to be sealed in Canada and shipping it to these boutique markets in China to sell with their tea because then they could say this tea is made with Canadian water. That's a huge, a huge um, selling advantage, right? So it, I think it depends on what you're selling. Food products in particular have a very strong uh, reputation of, of quality control, safety, uh, and that type of thing when you're selling around the world, other products may not. I mean, uh, you know, there's other products that are very generic and they could come from anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's coming from Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very well said. So again, it goes back to really understanding your sector, really understanding your customer, um, and building those relationships to understand the market that you're selling to and what it is that they're looking for and what their needs are. And just to absolutely. add in that, John, um, no, absolutely, you're, you're right, Rob and Redeemer. Just to add in that, like, I think the process for the research is also similar to the process for when you eventually want to sell and you're looking for referral to business, right? Um, part of what um, the network of support that um, these organizations provide in countries is that you can actually get introduced to business um, prospects to do discovery, right? So it might not be, oh, I want to make this call right now to sell. It might be, I want to find out a little bit more about the market. And that's where you're doing your own primary research, where you're the one actively speaking to people. There's the aspect that Redeemer talked about and Rob talked about where you are doing secondary research, where you're looking at reports that have already been prepared about those markets that can then give you a sense of what some of the opportunities are. So th that could be the first step, getting this market report, doing the secondary research, but then in talking to prospects, again, the, the, the Boots on the ground, feet on the ground could also help you get access to that. And maybe you can even do some of that here in Canada, like I said, with some of the associations that are built here. Again, talking to people will give you a sense for what it is that um, will work and won't work. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So we've got one minute left. Redeem, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, for those entrepreneurs, scale up founders who are on the fence about going international or maybe intimidated by, you know, all the steps that need to be taken and all the planning that's involved. What final words of inspiration or encouragement would you have for those people? I would say, I don't think you have a choice. <laughs> you need to expand globally <laughs> to survive. So, so if you want to succeed, uh, and it's a good thing that, uh, you know, uh, if, if I'm un uncomfortable with the, uh, with the thought of expanding uh, internationally, that's a good thing. That means that I know that it's going to be a difficult journey, uh, that I don't know a lot of things and I need to learn a lot of things. Uh, but 
Canada has a lot of resources. Uh, the government uh, is supporting entrepreneurs in multitudes of ways. There are sectoral programs, there are gender-based programs, there are there are programs for scaling up. There are programs, uh, you know, there are programs inviting entrepreneurs from other countries to Canada. Uh, so obviously, uh, the government is focusing on building its own SME sector. Uh, but it won't survive if it doesn't uh, expand internationally. So it, I think it, I think for every uh, every small and medium business, uh, it just needs to be part of their business plan that eventually they will expand uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. Very well said. It's imperative, and if you're feeling intimidated, that's a great sign because you're recognizing, you know, the the path that that is ahead of you. Um, so. It's 11.30. Thank you all so much for being here. Uche, co-founder and CEO of Hitch, Redeemer Program Manager of Canada India Acceleration Program, and Rob, Senior Account Manager at Export Development Canada. Uh, please feel free to reach out to them uh, if you are looking to expand internationally. And please join us for next week's session uh, where we're going to talk about scaling your product. So thank you all for being here and big round of applause for our speakers, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Yeah. Bye now.